going to get started. Okay, perfect. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining. I need to keep remembering to look here at the camera and not to the side, which is where your faces are. Um, my name is Allison McLean. I will be, you know, doing this webinar today on building equity into our work. And I'll be talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion considerations for the developmental services sector. Um, so there's a lot of new faces and people that I don't know today, so I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, so I'm a researcher by background. Uh, so that's my training is in research, both clinical uh, research, but also behavioral uh, research. And I am a disruptor. I will say um, I care so much about equity, both in, a, in the ways that it affects me, but also in ways that it affects everyone because I feel a connectedness and a sense of responsibility to other people that I share this world with. So um, that's a little bit about me. I am co-founder of Sisonke Inc., which is an uh, equity, diversity and inclusion um, consulting firm. Uh, that I co-founded with my partner, Jermaine McLean. And um, I also am working with CLO for the past almost two years as the diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. And as of this year, I am the chair of the equity, diversity, and inclusion community of practice for the developmental services sector. Uh, all of these things are a mouthful, so I will pause so to take that in a little bit. But that's a little bit of who I am. I'm also a mom, I'm a daughter, uh, I'm an immigrant, and um, I'm a bit of a storyteller. So a little bit of what I'll be doing today is just that telling a bit of a story about the developmental services sector from a different perspective. If there's any comments or questions at any point, please put them in the chat. I will try to glance at the chat every so often so that I can answer anything that comes up within the context of when it was answered. Um, but feel free to use, you know, some of the raising hands or other actions as well to get my attention throughout the session. Um, so as always, I start with the land acknowledgement because I am living and working um, on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabewaki, and the Huron-Wendat. Um, for anyone who is new to land acknowledgements, um, nativeland.ca is a great uh, website that has so much information. So you can put in a postal code, you can put in a city, and it will let you know the treaties that are covered on the lands that you are on, and it will let you know um, which peoples um, are represented as well on the lands that you are on. So the agenda for today, I will focus on three things because we only have an hour. So there's only so much I can talk about, but I will talk a bit about historical context about the developmental services sector. And then I'll talk a little bit about current trends, uh, both in the sector, but also in the country at large. And then I'll share three strategies for change. So everything I'm doing today is three, three, three. Um, so hopefully three is a lucky number. Um, I love quotes. <laughs> I love inspirational quotes and things like that. So the one that really resonated with me that I chose for today is today teaches tomorrow a lesson. And I share this because, you know, this month is community living month. So a lot of um, organizations in our sector are celebrating, you know, how long they have been in existence, but also I think Community Living Month in some ways um, stands for and represents how long our sector as a whole has been in existence. So today, since I will be talking a bit about some of those histories, I hope that we take those lessons of today um, you know, in the histories that I'm going to talk about as lessons for tomorrow and how we go forth into our work in the sector. So um, the developmental services sector um, started, you know, to organize in different ways 
uh, in the 1940s to the 1950s, right? So at that time, society was a certain way. So some of the things that were happening or that existed or were true in society at that time um, include segregation, right? So at the time in Ontario, segregation was legislated. So, you know, and also in many places across Canada. So things like black children and Asian children not being able to go to the same schools um, as white children that was legislated because at the time, um, the governments and also the parents of these children did not want racial mixing, right? So they didn't want their children to be in the same schools. So it wasn't always possible for there to be separate schools. So they existed a wide array of situations, including separate schools, but also having um, use of the same school, but at different times, right? So maybe one group of students are attending in the morning, another group is attending in the evenings and things like that. Um, but also at this time, residential schools existed, right? It was legislated and it was happening and it was being enforced, right, through the systems um, that existed, including policing, right? Police were collecting indigenous children forcibly and removing them from their homes and taking them to residential schools at that time. And, you know, all of this was happening at the same time as the beginnings of the developmental sector, developmental services sector. And another thing that I want to bring up at this time as well is language, right? Language is fluid. So some of the names, right, of our organizations or of the groups, you know, um, of our organizations when they came together were in today's context would be seen as very offensive, you know, inappropriate, ableist, all of these different things. But these were the times, right? People spoke about certain things in certain ways, people's perception um, about disability, right? And people being able to contribute in society was a certain way, but also people's care, right? About creating inclusive spaces was different, right? And I think it's also important to share that at this time, a lot of the people who are coming together and beginning uh, these movements, you know, the disability rights movement uh, and the sector were Christian because at the time, um, people, you know, who held power and participated in society in those ways were Christian. And I also want to share um, these statistics that I have to dig up, okay? It was a struggle, but I did it for all of you. Um, the population distribution of Canada at the time. So between 1940s and 1960s, um, the census was being done every 10 years, which is different from how it is now. Uh, the categories for race or ethnicity, this is all it was. So it was indigenous heritage, it was Asian heritage, it was African heritage, and then it was Europe, well, it was other European, and then it was British Isles. So I combined them because, you know, easier to do that. So as you can see, you know, from this uh, short table, basically between 1940s and 1960s, majority, an overwhelming majority of folks were of European heritage. And at the time, I think we can um, all agree in today's context that they were probably, you know, white. They might have had different ethnicities and things like that. And also, I don't want to minimize the fact that other people of European heritage who came to Canada around that time were experiencing discrimination based on other uh, things like being Jewish and things like that, right? But I just have grouped it this way because this is how it is in the census. But also I want to uh, paint the picture that shows that less than 2% of the population at the time when our sector was forming, right, was racialized folks, less than 2%, right? And this was consistent between the 1940s and the 1960s. And you might be surprised uh, that the indigenous um, population was small, right, at this time, because, you know, someone might be wondering, well, if indigenous people have always been here, why would the population only be 1%? But that's because of, um, you know, the depopulation that happened and the um, 
mass murders, but also, um, you know, indigenous folks died because of disease, you know, when Europeans came to North America or Turtle Island at the time. So this is why the population was so low. Um, so if we can all sort of agree, right, if we're all following here, that the sector was probably started by, you know, uh, people of European heritage, probably who were Christian at the time, for other people of European heritage who were also Christian at the time. And I think this is a safe thing to say based on knowing what these times were like, right? Um, I think we can all agree that the initial modes of service delivery, the initial places in which um, uh, locations, you know, showed up or were built and things like that um, made a difference because segregation existed at that time. So even if, let's say, people would have been open to having people of other, you know, uh, races or ethnicities and things like that, or even religions come, you know, and receive services, the location alone of the services would have been a barrier to access. So just want to, you know, put that out there. And then continuing, oh, no, my slide. There we go. So continuing on now, to the 1960s and 1970s, segregation continued to be there, right? Um, in the 1960s, early in the 1960s, there were changes made to immigration policy that actually in, encouraged immigration. And this was because of um, a need for people to move to Canada uh, to join the labor force, right? So this was not because you know, people were no longer racist or discriminatory against certain racial and ethnic uh, groups. It was based on need, right? Needs that a lot of different uh, industries and sectors um, needed people to come work. And later on in the 1970s, uh, the government introduced the Immigration Act uh, under which, you know, refugees became distinct classes of immigrants for the first time in Canadian history. Um, and the planning for future immigration, um, you know, by the government became mandatory. So we started receiving a lot of uh, immigrants by refugee status. Um, in fact, between 1970 and 1980, uh, Canada was one of the main three uh, immigrant receiving nations in the world, right? But at this time, even though there was more immigration to Canada, segregation continued, right? So examples of this are the fact that in 1965, the last segregated school in Ontario um, closed. So this is segregation for Black folks and Asian folks. So this is not residential schools. But as we all know, even when things become law, right, in terms of when slavery was abolished or all these different things, it doesn't happen right away. So I'm stating it as a fact. However, we know segregation continued because, you know, Black folks and Asian folks still couldn't work the same jobs, still couldn't live in the same neighborhoods, still couldn't attend the same theaters, or if they did attend the same theaters and things like that, um, they couldn't sit in the same sections, right? As white folks, there was designated seating and things like that. Also, same thing for restaurants, bathrooms, um, you know, drinking fountains, swimming pools segregation continued en masse. It did not really change in meaningful ways yet at this time. Um, and at this time, uh, there was now, you know, a growth even more of disability rights activism. So earlier, um, the activism was more families, you know, uh, doing this on behalf of their children or churches doing this on behalf of people with disabilities. But in the 1960s to 70s, that's when there was a rise of self-advocates. And at this time as well, there was a lot happening in the States, right? I think a lot of uh, what happens in Canada and the States mirrors each other in many different ways, right? And so, for example, in the U.S. in the 1960s, the Black Panther movement was growing and they were actually cross-organizing with disability rights activists and activists of other types, right? Um, so I think it's important to think about that context and think about how it started to change the projection a little bit of what we were seeing um, in our sector. 
But at this time, residential schools continued, right? So nothing had changed uh, regarding residential schools. And at this time as well, they had started forced sterilizations of people that were seen as undesirable, right? So this affected the sector, but it also affected, you know, other people like indigenous people um, who were already, you know, being marginalized and experiencing oppression in multiple ways. So then for a little, the last piece of historical context, right? So this is the third decade of our sector, right? Our sector's inception. So in the 1980s and the 1990s, Segregation is still happening, right? So the last residential school uh, closed in 1996. Um, and in 1986, the Federal Employment Equity Act came into force, right? So this addressed barriers towards women, towards indigenous people, towards people with disabilities, towards people who were racialized. And it just basically tried to create um, systems uh, through which, or legislature through which people um, who were at these intersections would not, would experience fewer barriers to uh, employment in the workplace. However, still at this time, I think a lot of us can agree that the world, right, in Canada was still very different in terms of um, there was not, you know, equity or anything like that. So these are the first, these are the inception years of the sector, right? So if we think about how um, at the time historically and, you know, sociopolitically, how when the sector started, certain things were seen as okay, right? So segregation was seen as okay, you know, systemic legislated racism was seen as okay. Um, the push towards Christianity, right? And the moral standing and moral grounds or superiority of Christianity, all these things were the so social norms at the time. So I think it's safe, you know, for me to say as someone especially new to the sector, that the sector in the ways that things have been created, in the ways that the systems and the institutions and all of the inner workings of how the sector functions and supports people and creates supports and um, distributes power, right, has not been equitable to everybody, right? It's been equitable to some people, but it has not been equitable or equal, you know, to everyone. So, you know, Allison, why do we care about this? Like, these are past things. We've all changed. We've all moved past it. We've learned from our mistake. Um, so why should we care? So I want to share a few current trends uh, with you that I hope will sort of um, get us all on board to why we should care, but also uh, get us on board to the need for us to change in order to continue to survive as a sector, um, but also in order to be on the right side of history, um, even though, you know, we may be a bit late to the party. So 16% of the population currently identifies as racialized. So these are stats from the 2021 census. Um, and by the way, all of this information I'm sharing, if anyone would like, you know, the uh, sources, I can share that. We'll be sending an email after today's session. So I can include all the sources in that email if people would like that. Um, also Christianity or so basically people identifying as Christian in the census is down 24% uh, from 2001. So in 2001, 77% um, of people self-identified as being Christian. Um, and now in 2021, only 53% identify as being Christian. Um, 30, what is it? 34.6% identified as having no religious affiliation. And this number has actually doubled since 2001, when it was only 16.5% identified as having no religious affiliation. 27% of the labor force um, currently, so 2022, um, identified as being immigrants. Uh, and 31.7% of employed Black women 
uh, worked in healthcare and social assistance and you know the developmental services sector is within that um, description per the government's definitions. And I think this is a very important statistic because all of us, I think in our organizations can see um, that at the front lines, there's a disproportionate representation of you know, black women, other racialized folks and immigrants, right? Um, which the second or this last stat reiterates as 81.2% of the employed black women working in healthcare and social assistance were immigrants, right? So I think, which is different because only 22.9% of employed white women working in healthcare and social assistance are immigrants. So I think this supports um, what we're seeing in the sector, which is um, the continued looking towards international recruitment uh, to, you know, basically help with staff shortages, right? So I think these current trends, if they are not starting to uh, make our minds see that as organizations, in order to keep our you know, staff happy, in order to keep our staff healthy, in order to stop you know, um, traumatizing our staff, because we all know that in the sector, certain things happen um, that are causing harm to our staff. For example, staff experiencing uh, being called racial slurs, by people supported or family members of people supported, staff experiencing, you know, racism and discrimination and other barriers to employment um, in the sector, right? And this is not just this sector, this is obviously across the board in Canada, in all sectors and industries. So I think it's important for us to look at this and think about why this could be. And today I'm putting forward that this is this is happening in this way because the sector was not created for certain people, right? So it's always um, served certain people, was created in certain ways, and those same um, systems or processes that were put in place, you know, 70, 75 years ago when the sector started have not changed in big, big ways that um, factor in the changes that the country has made. So if you remember from the slide a few slides ago where I said less than 2% of people in Canada uh, in the 1940s and 1950s were racialized, it's now 16% of people in Canada identify as racialized, right? So these are big changes, but also the fact that people identifying as Christian right, is also reducing and people who identify with no religious affiliation, but also people who identify as other religions like Muslim and, you know, um, Sikh and all these different things, those are also increasing and we are not in the sector adequately addressing some of these big changes that we're seeing in terms of the workforce, but also the people that we are providing services to or the people that we should be providing services to. Um, so a final stat uh, on um, the change in the people that we potentially may be providing services to now uh, is from the Canadian Survey on Disability. So this is the 2017 one because the 2022 one comes out in December, so it's not out yet. But um, in the 2017 one, 22% of Canadians 15 years and older uh, self-reported having a disability. 14% uh, of the people who identified as having a disability identified also as a visible minority. So I use that terminology because that's what the census has it as. So I've just kept it that way so that if anyone looks it up, the numbers are matching. Um, and 21% also who identified as having a disability identified as also being an immigrant to Canada. And 5% of the people who identified as having a disability uh, reported having a developmental disability. So I think compared to when the sector started, right, and the disability rights movement started, we can all, again, agree that the people that we are potentially uh, providing supports to have changed, right, considerably. And 
our approach to this work, right, and to the processes and the systems that are in place should also change as a result. Um, I see some things in the chat, so I will just take a look. Okay, so I will just answer um, a couple of questions that I see in the chat because I was moving a bit fast. So someone, Marcel asked, did segregation policies exist in Canada? Um, he thought it was only in the US, but yes, segregation policies existed in Canada, um, all across Canada as well. So it was legislated that black children uh, and also Asian children could not go to schools um, to the same public schools as white children. So this was legislated in Ontario, BC, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, lots of places in Canada had that. And then some of these things may not have been legislated specifically, but there were laws, for example, saying businesses could serve who they wanted. So, you know, that's why now we have laws that say, you know, businesses or employers cannot uh, discriminate against people based on race, ethnicity, gender, and all of the things, right? It's because before um, the law stated that businesses could do whatever they wanted, right? They could refuse to serve certain people if they wanted to. And that obviously, because of the social context um, at the time, it created segregation, right? It created systems that were enforced by law that businesses could say, no, we don't you know, like whether it's a theater, they can say, no, we don't allow, you know, Asian people to frequent um, our theater or, you know, yes, you can be here. However, you have to come in through the back or you can only sit in these designated seats. You cannot, you know, mingle and interact with uh, white folks who are sitting, you know, at the front. So, yes, it was legislated and um, I can share some links at the end as well. And Teresa said, um, I like to know. Yes, so Teresa is saying that we do need to make more inclusive um, practices across the province so that no one has barriers at all. And yes, I 100% agree with you. Um, so I will be continuing now to share, like, what are some of these strategies that we can do for change? So we've identified a problem, right, which is that. The sector was not, you know, um, a very common saying nowadays is nothing without us, nothing for us without us, right? So the sector um, did do that, except the us was only a small group of people, right? At the time, obviously, that group of people was 97 to 98% of the population, but again, it was still a very narrow group of people who were benefiting from, you know, the resources and systems that were put in place to support families who had uh, family members who had uh, uh, disabilities. So now to sort of start to undo some of the barriers that, right, that existed based on social and historical and political context at the time, um, I will put forward three things, right, because three things I think are somewhat digestible. So the first one I would say is learning and unlearning, right? The second one, action. And the third one, um, I wanted to share some lessons from Dean Dory Turnstall uh, from OCAD University here in Ontario. So the first one, when I say learning and unlearning. So I think for a lot of us in the sector, we have a lot of training um, available. Some of it is free, some of it is not free that we can do for ourselves, for our staff. So having diversity, equity, and inclusion training available for staff um, throughout different organizations. And this can't be a one and done, right? This training is ongoing because this work of disrupting, this work of unlearning things that we have been taught from birth to be true, right? So things like that, they are differences. I think so many of us, strongly believe that there are differences, you know, between different races, for example, right? And because so much of what we see on television, so much of what we see, you know, in newspapers, so much of what we see in movies and things like that reinforces those beliefs, 
right? Based on who is always portrayed as being deserving of empathy, right? Who's always portrayed as being good versus who's always portrayed as, you know, demonstrating criminality or violence or, you know, um, like all these negative things. Like TV and the news, the media, all of this by design reinforces racism and discrimination, right? Against people of all types, people with disabilities and things like that. So it's so important that we start unlearning and evaluating what unconscious biases do we hold to be true, right? What things do we need to work on as individuals to create change, right? Um, part of learning and unlearning is reading books. So reading books written by people who don't look like you, right? So reading books um, from different perspectives, right? Um, than what you are surrounded by or by what you're used to, right? Watching TEDx talks, YouTube videos, movies, documentaries. There's so many free resources available out there that we can all turn to to learn more about so many of these different things. There's so many resources even about the disability justice movements, for example, uh, which started um, happening in the US in the 2000s, where people realized, um, not realized, where people started advocating for those who were living at multiple intersections of oppression, right? So those who were you know, racialized and had a disability and maybe did not speak English as their first language and were low income, right, as a result of you know, barriers to uh, getting jobs and things like that, right? So reading and finding all of these materials. And I think the most important thing, arguably, uh, in part of your learning and unlearning is actually listening, right? So listening to soak in and to understand, listening in to people so you understand as opposed to listening to respond. Because sometimes when people are sharing things with us, some of us listen just to say something back, or some of us listen just to find something that is opposite to what the person said. So actually just listening, right? And not necessarily always having a response or having follow-up questions, but taking what someone shared, right? And taking that and going on and doing your own self-learning. Because when people who experience multiple uh, levels of oppression are sharing things or teaching you or having to teach you, um, there's a lot of emotional labor associated with that, right? So trying to listen more and not gaslight, right? So just because something is not how you experience the world or not what you thought the world was like does not mean it's not true. So listening to people and believing people. And um, the second, uh, strategy that I'm sharing with you all is action, right? Be an ally, right? So talk to people, learn, do your own work. You doing your own work of learning what racism is, how discrimination shows up and looks like in the workplace, what barriers to access people have, that's you being an ally. These resources are available. So it might be easy to go ask your friend, you know, who is Muslim and you're like, oh, probably you're experiencing Islamophobia. Let me ask you about it. That's not you doing the work. You doing the work is you going and doing your own learning, right? Because these resources are available. You doing that, taking that on yourself and then you showing up for your friend and saying, you know what? I've been learning about this. How can I support you? You know, are there any barriers you face in your work? Um, you know, that I can be a support for you on, right? Showing up for our staff in those different ways. And then we also talk about being an accomplice, right? So being part of the disruptive process, right? Being part of rejigging systems so that they start to work better for everybody. Being an accomplice to creating inclusive spaces for everyone, right? And being a co-conspirator as well. So this means showing up even when you might lose something, right? So speaking up even when you might lose something, doing the unpopular thing, doing the thing that has not been done before, right? The thing that 
people don't want to touch, saying the uncomfortable truth, acknowledging these uncomfortable truths of our history right here in Canada and how we benefit from some of these things, some of us, right? Some of these systems benefit some of us more than other people, right? So for me and myself, for example, um, I am educated, right? I've gone to university, I've gotten a degree, and that means I get certain privileges in this world that other people who have not got a, a university degree do not have. So sometimes in my exercising my right, for example, maybe to employment because of having this degree or me trying to progress in my career because I have this degree, sometimes that can be done in ways that are oppressive to other people, right? So me being, being a co-conspirator to other people who might not have similar privileges to me in certain situations is me saying, you know, during an interview, you know, I think even someone who doesn't have a degree could do this job because there are other ways of getting these skills, like through community organizing, through, you know, things like this. We can show up, you know, for other people in different ways and disrupt, right? Shake things up. Let's not continue to let things continue um, in the way they've always happened because that's how they've always happened, right? Um, so I'm going to read some of the comments in the chat. Um, so I'll answer Jermaine's question later after the third point. Uh, Teresa says, yes, it would be nice or great to get a job, but as we mentioned about barriers or not being included in a workplace, that is very sad because they don't give self-advocates a chance to get a job. And that's very true, right? So saying at your workplace, you know, why don't we hire self-advocates? I think that's a valid question in the sector. Why don't we hire self-advocates for certain positions, right? Why don't we reduce barriers to access to employment for everybody, right? How, in what ways, even within the developmental services sector, do we recreate barriers to access to employment um, and housing and all these things for people that we say we support? In what ways are we also reproducing those same harms, right? And I would say we reproduce those same harms because of the focus on systems, right? Historically, the way systems and institutions have been created has always been in ways that benefit those who already have societal power and disenfranchise those who already do not have societal power. Um, and I think there was another comment here. Shyla says, listening to learn. Exactly, listening to learn as opposed to listening to respond, right? And the other comment here, Shyla added was, I think it begins with me. I think we should all strive to be the change we wish to see in the world. It is helpful when organizations support and encourage learning and change. However, individual motivation is key. And that's exactly it. Because all of us have been sold this fallacy, right, in the world that by myself, I can't do big things. I'm one small person, you know, I have a small job, I don't have societal power, I don't have privilege. Who am I to, you know, say, oh no, this is bad, no one will listen to me. But the truth is, we don't we have collective power. I think all of us in conversations, we all agree, right, that racism is bad, discrimination is bad, barriers to access is bad, right? So how can we all bring our individual power to these collective concerns that we all have? How can we work together as allies, accomplices, and co-conspirators to each other? Because all these issues are nuanced and intersectional, right? They're cross-cutting. So how can we all come together to disrupt? And the last lesson or strategy I'll share with you um, is lessons from Dean Dory Tunstall. So uh, Dean Dory, she actually, um, this is her last year of tenure at the OCAD University, which is the Ontario College of Art and Design. So she started there in 2016. She was actually the first Black Dean of a design program ever, right, in the world, ever. And 
She's a, uh, she's a designer by trade. She's a leader in the movement to decolonize design. And she's overall just an amazing person who used, and this is me even obviously, because it's not a lot of time, just making um, three examples of what she did to disrupt the status quo, right? So she did transformation through cluster hires. So when she started at OCAD University, um, in the 140 plus years since the university, university's inception, there had never been a full-time Black uh, faculty, nor, they had, nor had there ever been a full-time uh, Indigenous faculty. So she did cluster hires. She hired five Indigenous uh, folks uh, for positions, and she hired several, I think it was maybe five or six Black folks as well. And she has talked about how when she does cluster hires, she tries to not only do, you know, cluster hires, as in several people at the same time, um, but she also tries to do it at different levels, right? So some people at entry level, some people at mid-level, and some people at senior level positions or executive positions, because that's what builds the change into the system, right? The people in the middle will pull the people who are, you know, at the bottom up, and the people at the top will pull the people in the middle up. So it creates a self-sustaining system of transformation when you do that. But also when you do cluster hires, you've not put the work of disrupting the status quo of a system, of an institution on one person. And a lot of times people who get hired, right, to come in and do EDI work or anti-racism work for an organization, or sometimes maybe you're not even hired for that position, but because you're racialized or you know you experience discrimination in other areas, right? You have a disability or something like that, it's sort of put on you to do that additional task of okay, now you have to help us address these issues, even though it's not your job, right? So if you want to create sustainable transformation, you have to do cluster hires, or at least that's one way that she did it. The other thing she did was remove structural barriers, right? So when we think of structural barriers um, in the sector, we can think of things like education requirements for certain positions, uh, both in and of itself, but also um, the expectation that if your education was in Europe or in Canada or the US, it's superior to if it was somewhere in the global South, right? So removing structural barriers is both um, changing your job descriptions to include, you know, lived experience and other, you know, community organizing experience, um, but also to including education that is outside of Canada, you know, um, the US and Europe. And then she also focused a lot on decolonization, right? So speaking truth of the fact that Canada continues to be a British colony and Canada continues to enact violence on indigenous folks and Canada continues to perpetuate white supremacy in and off the fact that it continues to do the same things and benefit and privilege the same people at the expense of others, right? And also taking on novel approaches to things and valuing um, indigenous ways of knowing, right? And, and other ways, like some communities do certain things in certain ways that maybe they can show a research paper or some, you know, legitimized way of showing that, yes, this has been studied and proven and this is the way to do it, right? So it's valuing other ways of knowing is how she uh, did the decolonization. And she's actually, made a huge transformation at OCAD University. I strongly encourage you to search her up and see some of the ways in which she's transformed uh, the culture and things like that there because they've been truly amazing. And I think it's something that in the sector as leaders, we can all aspire to, right? How can I uh, do the same thing in my organization? And I will look at uh, more. Comments in the chat. Okay, so I'm good on the comments. So I'm just going to share a quick video and then I'll share some resources and then we can, you know, have some questions.
My name is Carrie Gray. Carrie Gray is a black disabled woman, and there's power behind that. In the United States, one in four in the black community have some type of disability, whether that's visible or invisible. Historically speaking, organizations and institutions have shown us that they want to identify with one thing and build power around that, build influence and access. And I get it, right? So um, this idea that you have disability rights, you have women's rights, you have LGBTQ rights, and those kind of different pockets are really building a strong narrative. But the thing that I find to be harmful is when we're not building in coalition. Because the reality is, is that you have people like myself who are black, disabled, and women, and so many other things. And when you live at the intersections of all three of those, then you can't split your political and social dynamics between these different groups. It doesn't produce real results of freedom, and it doesn't produce real results of access to employment and other opportunities that you're looking for. I'll give one example on this. So the Black Lives Matter movement. When it was created, it was created in conjunction mostly with a lot of young folks. What was unique about this particular movement was the intersectional philosophy that was built upon. The folks getting up and saying, we are not just fighting for one narrative, but we are specifically fighting for folks who are on the margins. We are fighting for black folks who are also LGBTQ, who are women, who are femme, who are trans, who are disabled. They named it. They saw like their people across the country and said, I'm fighting for all of you not just some of you, not just the ones that have traditionally gained power and access. And that gives me a lot of hope um, because no one wants to be left behind. Okay, so I love that video because it resonates so much with what we see in the sector, with what we see when it comes to organizing in Canada, right? No one wants to be left behind. And I think in this sector, that means not only the people supported and the many ways in which they can identify in all of the intersections at which they possibly experience oppression and marginalization and discrimination, but it also means for our staff, right? Our staff are also diverse and they are also living at many intersections. And if we can't see that and change course and course correct accordingly, that's going to be disastrous for the sector, you know, and you might be thinking like, whoa, Allison, like your content has been a bit clunky in terms of you going from the history to what we're seeing now, like it doesn't seem cohesive, but I did that by design, right, to show that all of this history happened and it was not addressed, right? So even though now we've rebranded and we've said like, oh no, you know, there's all these laws against uh, discrimination based on race, gender, disability, you know, all of these different things, nothing huge has changed in the way the systems continue to operate, right? So that feeling you might be feeling of, whoa, like this is disjointed and disconnected, that's how people living at the intersections of multiple systems of oppression feel, right? Because everyone else who experiences privilege and who doesn't have, you know, barriers to access is keeping on moving, is keeping on going. And for them, things seem to be progressing and getting better or what have you, right? But for some of us who have been at the margins from birth, right? And from even before we were born, there's that disconnect, right? So hopefully I was able to portray that today. Um, so what can I do, Allison? What resources are available in the sector? Um, so I'm excited to share that soon there will be resources on real exchange. We, as the equity, diversity, and inclusion community of practice for the sector, as well as Central Region, we've collaborated with Real Exchange to bring together um, resources. We're going to have videos. We're going to have toolkits. We're going to have 
all types of information, policies, and these are things that people um, are sharing, right? So these are both specific to the sector that you can take as a template and, you know, make it work for your organization. But there's also other resources that are for learning and things like that. So coming soon, look out for that. And also these are some books. These books are recommendations we shared at the conference last year. But for anyone who has not read them, I strongly encourage you to check out some of these books. And like I said, we will send emails with um, a list of these resources so you can refer back and look them up. And then these are some podcasts that you can check out, right, um, that can help you do some of that learning and unlearning uh, for yourself. And I also want to share that we have commenced uh, the data, collect data collecting uh, process through a survey uh, specific to the sector. And it's a survey on equity, diversity, and inclusion practices among developmental sector agencies. Um, and I think we would greatly value if you participate in this uh, survey. So we, won't, we only want one person from each organization to do the survey. So I'm sharing it in the chat, but I hope that um, it is sent to the appropriate EDI or HR person or the ED, you know, someone who um, knows all of the... Uh, things that have gone towards addressing equity, diversity, and inclusion in your organization so that they can complete the survey. It's open for the next two weeks, and we will be sharing the results with the sector. Um, it's the first time this type of data is being collected, so I strongly encourage that you share. And uh, that's all I have for today, but please, um, I welcome you to ask questions. So I'll go back to Jermaine's question, which said, what can organizations that don't have a lot of funding do to build equity. So I would say empower your people that you already have in your organization to do their work, right? A lot of racialized people or people who experience discrimination along many intersections, right? Based on religion, being part of the LGBTQ plus community, having a disability. A lot of times you sometimes can't even do your job because people don't listen to your ideas, right? So you make suggestions on what will increase accessibility and people tell you, no, we can't do that, right? And there's no valid reasons why you can't do that. So if I had to share one thing that an organization doesn't have money, that doesn't have money that they can do, listen to your people, empower your people, right? Um, we obviously in the sector have diversity, right? On the front lines, let's listen to the ideas of our staff. Um, and yeah, any more questions you can unmute or you can type them in the chat. Um, yes. I'm going to stop sharing that way I can see people's faces. Uh, by the way, this recording is going to be available on Real Exchange. I can share that now. Um, following this, when the oh, so the survey is not working. So let me see if I can type it again. Um, oh, yeah. I'm just going to type put the survey in the chat again because the link I added is not working. While I search for the link to the survey, please feel free to unmute if you have um, a question or anything or comments. We always welcome comments. I'm just uh, grabbing the non-hyperlink link. Okay, I've re-added the link. Oh, thank you, Al. <laughs> I've re-added the link. Okay. Okay, awesome. So if you are, you know, shy to 
ask questions, feel free to email with questions or, you know, we would love to continue the conversation. And um, I would also love feedback on uh, what everybody thought about the session and information being presented together in this way. Uh, did it connect? Did it not? Um, and yes, Amanda just added in the chat, please join Real Exchange uh, for many reasons. There's lots of great resources, um, but also so that you are aware when the EDI uh, page launches on there, which will be soon. Uh, so please check that out. And of course, someone chooses to call the house phone now, but that's okay. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you joining today. Everyone gets an extra minute back off their day. And as always, I welcome feedback. You can email me um, or reach out in other ways. I'll... And we will send the resources um, to everyone who was registered to attend so that they can check out some of the graphs and uh, things themselves. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.